I first became aware of Curtis, I think, in 2008. Uh, when was it 2008 when you did the Nobel lecture? That was 2008. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's a there's a place called Gustavus Adolphus. Uh, is it university or college in the college. states? Yeah. Which has uh, the Nobel lecture every the Nobel lectures uh, every year, and um, uh, I heard that there was there was digging going on here in Mossel Bay, uh, and uh, that Curtis had made the uh, opening address at the uh, at the Gustavus Adolphus Nobel lecture series that year. And I, you can watch it online. I've embedded it in the Visit Mossel Bay website. Go to Visit Mossel Bay forward slash archaeology. And you'll see it embedded on one of the posts there. Uh, it, you need a fast bandwidth because it's about, it's about an hour or perhaps longer. But it was one of the most wonderful speeches I've ever heard. And really, uh, it fired me up because I, I realized that Mossel Bay is about to change. It may not be today, but it's going to change everything for tourism in the Western Cape. And, and the result is, uh, it, it's as a result of the fines which Peter and, and his uh, colleague, uh, Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan, Kaplan. Kaplan, Jonathan Kaplan, made uh, in, when, when they were doing the environmental impact assessment on this uh, property for the construction of this, uh, this, this golf course and this estate, they discovered the ecology, the, the, the archeology span in these caves. Curtis was called in, they, they studied it, and what we're gonna hear today is a discussion, uh, I hope, about what's happened since then, and they really are the most amazing finds. Um, Curtis is uh, with the Arizona State University School of Human Origins. Um, he comes out to do his digging here, and I understand you go home to study and to, and to, and to, to lecture. Is that correct? Yeah. So we're very fortunate to have him here, and uh, I'm very honored. Thank you very much, Curtis. Okay, so if you, if you do go and watch that uh, Gustavus Adolphus lecture, um, you're going to have to forget much of what's in it because it's all out of date. Good. And that's how, <laughs> that's just what it that's how fast <laughs> science actually operates. You know, something in 2008 is completely out of date. We've had many, many more discoveries, both from our project and from other projects that work on the origins of modern humans that have, have made it somewhat outdated. I, maybe they'll invite me back again and I'll, I'll update it for them. Um, what I was asked to do was give you uh, an overview of the scientific significance of Pinnacle Point. Um, that's a big task because the record here is so rich and vast and it's very hard to cover in 20-25 minutes, which is the time that they've asked me to, to speak in. Uh, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to give you a bit of the context of what are the scientific problems that we're interested in. Uh, the research that has been going on here has been funded by about five million dollars of external scientific of funds. And research money is very tight, and that's a very good reflection of how significant the international community considers the research um, that's going on at the caves uh, today. And hopefully that, that money will continue to flow and we'll be able to continue the research um, that we're doing. <clears throat> I want to give um, thanks to my team. Uh, we go by the acronym SACP4. It's a long uh, term, but we are a very transdisciplinary project. We don't work just on archaeology, we work on climate change, environmental change, and I'm going to give you at the very end of the talk um, just a tidbit of the, of the kind of results that we've been publishing on that as well. So it's not only archaeology and human origins, but it's the climatic and environmental context um, for those events. And that team, SACP4 team, it's about 40 scientists from around the world. There's quite a few South Africans, but there's also people from the United States, England, France, Israel, a lot of Australians, um, all of them coming to Pinnacle Point on a regular basis to do their work and to contribute to the overall picture that we're putting together. So um, what are the research questions? Why, why are scientists interested in this particular place? Well, um, we're working on the very tail end of the human origin story. So many of you have probably heard of the fossils up in the cradle. Uh, that material is two million years old. That's when we're looking at the origins of things like bipedality, upright walking. But our work research project is at the very end. We're interested in the transition to people like, uh, like you and me, fully modern humans. When did modern cognition develop? And when did the special, what we call the special unique features of modern humans appear? And modern humans, relative to other animals, have a wide diversity of very unique features. But two of them that I just want to point to is that we have 
um, unique pro-social proclivities. And what we mean by pro-social behaviors or pro-social pro proclivities, and these seem to be in, embedded in the genome, so they're, they're in our nature, <coughs> is that we don't follow standard models of rationality. So we don't cooperate just with kin, in other words, people we're related to, which biology can predict very well, but we cooperate very effectively with non-kin. So we can put people together into a group like this and we're not related to each other, and, and we, we operate well. And a, a good colleague of mine, Sarah Hurdy, uh, she often says, imagine trying to get 400 chimps to, line, to queue up uh, and get on a plane sit down and fly for 14 hours to South Africa. When, the, when that plane landed, one chimp would get off and there would just be bloody meat. And the, and the rest, you, there's no other animal that cooperates like, like us. And so we, we cooperate in these large groups with genetically unrelated individuals. And what that allows us to do is, is create these large interconnected social networks that make our species really extraordinary at getting things done. Um, but in particular, what these interconnected social networks allow is they allow uh, <coughs> intergroup cooperation between bands, and by bands, that's the, that's the basic social unit of hunter-gatherers, and of course we evolved in a hunter-gatherer economy, and that allows things like mate exchange, reciprocity, risk management, but also particularly cooperative aggression. So our pro-social behavior is not, not only allows us to cooperate, but it gives us extraordinary abilities to make war on other groups. So it has a, a, a light side, and then it has this kind of darker side, uh, which results in the, the, the cooperative violence that we see. Does that explain Justin Bieber? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we have a highly sophisticated cognition and symbolically organized worldview. And the most complex symbolic system that we have is language, the ability to use sound to communicate complex uh, thoughts between each other and something we call cumulative culture. And this is the ratcheting up in complexity of things like technology and social systems that allow us to build extraordinary complex societies. So we're very interested, scientists are very interested in when these two things appear in human origins. Do they appear uh, 200,000 years ago, a million years ago, or, or what? And we're starting to get a consensus that these two final aspects appear quite late. So let's talk about that. So when and where do they evolve, those traits evolve? It's become one of the great scientific problems of the world today. Many, many scientists working on it at this point. And we're very near a synthetic theory. And that when a scientific investigation is near a synthetic theory, there's an enormous amount of excitement. Because when we get a synthetic theory, we jerk that science forward, and it opens up all kinds of new understandings, and um, opens up new questions, of course. And it's also what we can call a super transdisciplinary question. So it cross-cuts psychology, neurobiology, studies of the brain. So we're learning a lot about how the brain operates by new neural imaging. Um, what we call cultural evolution studies, that's the work that we do, how the, the cultures evolve. Primatology, which is the study of non-human primates, chimps, how they differ from us, even though they're our uh, closest living relatives. It involves a lot of mathematical modeling, so we have economists involved in these studies. And importantly, what context did it occur? Ancient climates and environments. So that's where that work comes from that um, I mentioned earlier. And then what we do, which we call paleoanthropology, that's the fossil record, fossil genetics. We can extract DNA from ancient fossils now, um, and archaeology. So this is what we bring to this overall big research question. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly review for you what we know about modern human origins. And at the bottom of this graph, um, I have the world record for temperature change. So this is taken from uh, the ice cores down in Antarctica. And when this line is up here, we're in an interglacial. And when it's down here, we're in a glacial. And today, of course, so this is hundreds of thousands of years, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. We're in an interglacial today. And one of the take-home messages is, is that 
throughout the majority of the time of hum modern human origins, the world is in a glacial phase. So the environment of our origins looked nothing like what it does today for most of that period. You can see these interglacials are little short um, peaks. Now what do we know? We know that 800,000, 700,000 years ago, there are two main lineages. One that I'll call the modern human lineage, and that appeared in Africa. And the second one called the Eurasian archaic lineage. And Neanderthals were part of that. Most people have heard of Neanderthals before. We shared our last common ancestor around 700,000 years ago. We know that between 700,000 and 400,000 years ago, there was gene flow between those two lineages. So people were moving in and out of Africa at that time and interbreeding, keeping them the same species. We know at 400,000 years ago, that gene flow was cut. So the transit point out of Africa was closed. So in a sense, a stopper got put into the bottle of Africa. And when gene flow gets cut, that's when lineages start to evolve into different species. Okay. We know now that there was a third lineage that broke off from Neanderthals around 200,000 years ago. And we call them the Denisovans. And they have been discovered from a, a finger bone in the Altai Mountains in Asia uh, that had very good DNA preservation. So the DNA was amplified. And it was expected to be a Neanderthal. It was clearly a totally new lineage, kind of a, what we call a mystery lineage. So around 200,000 years ago, we have a modern human lineage living in, uh, living in Africa and the Neanderthal lineage, mostly in Europe, and the Denisovan lineage <coughs> in East Asia. So, because can I, that, that gene flow, does that mean it was kind of an interspecies that had, the species hadn't quite uh, separated? Yet? Hadn't quite separated, right? So, um, when we see, so in other words, in the genetic record, we can see a splitting, but they're kept the same species by regular interbreeding, okay? And then, but then it gets cut, and then they move into very different directions. Okay? Does that coincide roughly with the when you split to the continents? No, this is, you know, at this time the continental drift is basically put the continents where they are today. Um, we believe we believe this gene flow cut has something to do with the formation of the Sahara Desert, which blocks exit out of sub Saharan Africa up into North Africa and then through uh, Egypt and then Sinai and the Geb Desert. Okay, so it's probably a, a landform formation that blocks the gene flow. We haven't quite figured that out, but that, that's, we'll figure this out quite shortly, I think. Okay, so the genetic record and the fossil record shows that our lineage, the lineage that leads to everybody alive on the planet today, appears sometime between 200,000 and about 140,000 years ago in Africa. And then 50,000 years ago, um, a founder population, a small founder population of Africans, leaves Africa, almost certainly through the Sinai Desert and the Negev in Egypt. Um, and that founder population um, gives rise to all Eurasians. So everyone of Eurasian, of European and Asian descent, is descended from that small founder population. And we know that from the genetic record. And what's very interesting is, is as that founder population leaves Africa, they encounter Neanderthals and they interbreed with Neanderthals, such that now all people of Eurasian descent have between about 1 and 3 percent Neanderthal DNA, and Africans don't have that. And um, then, of course, there's a, a very fast radiation of lineages. So, Japanese, Indians, Australians, Melanesians. So imagine this modern founder population is released into the world. Uh, Neanderthal, it interbreeds with Neanderthals, but Neanderthals go extinct. And they're, they're racing across the planet. Um, and all these new lineages are forming. And then something very interesting happens. So, for, so I've only put the Malaysian and Aboriginal, so these are Australian Aborigines here. They get to Eastern Asia and encounter the Denisovans and interbreed with the Denisovans. And the Denisovans have left traces of their DNA in the genome of Melanesians and Australians. And Africans and Eurasian and Eastern or Western Europeans don't have that um, DNA. And then we also know that in Africa there were some very archaic lineages hanging around. Um, 
and Africans, modern Africans, interbred with them after the split with that lineage, such that they retain some ancient genes from those lineages. And on these lines, where I have an arrow, that means that lineage is with us today, so those people with, are with us, and where it's a circle, they're extinct. So those African archaic lineages go extinct, Neanderthals go extinct, Denisovans go extinct, and I would not be surprised that, and that over the next five, ten years we discover new lineages that we don't know, and of course all of those are extinct as well, right? It's only our lineage that is left. Now, um, so our lineage appears, that modern human lineage appears, like I said, between about 190,000 years ago and about 130, 100, uh, 130,000. And that's during a very cold glacial phase. <coughs> and that's crucial for understanding why Pinnacle Point's important. So here's Africa, a projection of what Africa would look like 230,000 years ago to 195. So it's just before the origin of our lineage. <clears throat> and the African continent, that's an interglacial, would be very wet. And there, we expect people lived all over Africa, and they were interbreeding with each other. So they stayed as one species. <clears throat> and then 195,000 years ago, the world enters a glacial. And when the world is glacial, Africa gets very dry. And the Sahara doubles in size. And there are only a small number of refuges left of in Africa that can support hunter-gatherers. And I think there probably are between maybe four to seven refugia. There were some refuges in Central Africa. There's one in the highlands of Ethiopia, maybe in the Maghreb in North Africa. So if you can imagine, so the continent's really dry, and now there's only five or six small populations left. We're almost extinct. It's a near extinction event for modern humans. One of those lineages gives rise to everybody on the planet today. One of them is the origin lineage. But some of these older ancient lineages interbreed with them as they spread. And I've hypothesized that it was the lineage here in the southern African subregion that is the progenitor lineage. Um, other, other scientists have other hypotheses, and we are testing them now to ideally eliminate the ones that are wrong. Um, why? Well, um, I think it's the special conditions, ecological conditions of this place that made it a good refuge. So you are, of course, all familiar with the Fane Boss. The Fane Boss is a very unique um, floral ecosystem. Um, but the reason it's good for people, hunter gathers, is because you have a super high diversity of plants with these called geophytes, these little bulbs. And they're great packages of carbohydrate for food. And importantly, they thrive in dry environments. So when Africa's really, when Africa's dry during these glacial periods, you would have a, a surplus of energy food available for hunter-gatherers, where that's not the case in the rest of Africa. And this graph shows you the frequency of geophyte species per area. And generally, uh, species diversity <coughs> increases as area. Here's the cake. You have 2,300 species of geophytes plants in these other Mediterranean ecosystems, um, which generally have high frequencies, only have a fraction of the diversity. So this is a great source of food for hunter-gatherers. And of course, many of the local people know that as well. The other thing that, that you have here that's very rich for hunter-gatherers is because the Agullus current, the warm Agullus current, comes down on the east, and you have a cold then well upwelling coming here, you have a collision of warm and cold water. And that provides you with one of the richest marine ecosystems anywhere in the world. So to give you an idea, um, many of you know how great the fishing is here. Uh, very high species diversity. In one of the richest fishing areas in North America, where I, I fished every summer of my life in coastal Maine, we have three species, and you have 20 to 25 you can fish in this rocky intertidal zone. Um, but even more importantly, you have these rich shellfish beds. So when you put the two together, um, you have the protein of the shellfish and the tubers below the ground creating the perfect diet to supply a refuge 
for these hunter-gatherer populations during these climate crises. And that's why we think that progenitor population was here. Okay, so when, in, when do the behavioral features of modern humans appear? Those unique characteristics that we were just talking about. about. Well, this is where I'm going to segue into the archaeology. Okay? We use proxies to recognize things like symbolic behavior. So what do I mean by proxies? Well, if we can find rock paintings, those are proxies. But also, modern humans symbol by things like scarification. So these two girls are Hadza girls. They're hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. Now, we can't find skin and that sort of thing in the archaeological record. But they belong to two different groups. And notice, they have different beaded necklaces. They symbol their group affiliation through the use of their jewelry. And we symbol our interest in other things, group affiliation and so on, through jewelry. Right? So that's invisible to the archaeologist, but that we can find. So when we find things like jewelry and so on, it's a, it's a proxy for symbolic behavior. <coughs> Humans also have very long, complex recipe technologies. And those require language for communication and to keep them at um, high fidelity through generations. So when we find those technologies, we use those are indicators that people could communicate complex recipes across generations. But one of the things that I think is most, ex most interesting is modern humans can recognize what we call novel associations. So this is a Khoisan hunter-gatherer, Bushman. And you're probably wondering why I'm showing you this disgusting grub after breakfast. Well, that grub, you know, creates a chrysalis. It lives in the, the dead roots of a tree in the Kalahari. Now, you can eat that grub, and people do eat that grub. But if you squish it up and rub it on a dart, it's a deadly poison if it breaks into the bloodstream of an animal. So that Bushman guy can put that, the juice of that grub on that dart, and he can kill a giraffe with it. Now, any of you who are hunters know that the most dangerous moment when you're hunting, the most hectic point, is when you've wounded that animal and you come up on it, and its instinct is screaming in its mind to get to its feet one last time and bury its horns in your stomach, right? But when you have a poison like that, you walk, you hit an animal, and you walk up to it, and it's paralyzed. It's a breakthrough adaptation. So those are the things that we look for in the archaeological record. How the heck did he figure that out? Who figured out that that grub could be made into a deadly poison that could kill a giraffe? Humans are fabulous at this. It's like that guy who someday visualized you know, a round thing and a hook and invented Velcro and made a billion dollars. Right? Novel associations. Okay. So those are the things we look for. Um, and South Africa has our best and oldest record for the origins of those kinds of indicators of behavioral complexity. And that, of course, brings us to Pinnacle Point. So why is Pinnacle Point so important? Here's a timeline. 180,000, 160, 140. Origin of our lineage is here, down in these times, like I said before. Here are the most important sites in South Africa Sabudu, Deep Cliff, Lombas, Classes, and here's our sites at Pinnacle Point. And these are the time ranges represented. You can see straight away, Pinnacle Point has the longest sequence of any of these sites, and importantly, we have a site at the origin point of our lineage. That's one of three in all of Africa that date to this time between 195,000 and 130,000 years ago. That's one reason why Pinnacle Point is so important. We have a sample from the, from the critical origin point of the lineage. So let's take a look at what those sites are. Um, many of you have seen Pinnacle Point. This is well before we had the golf course, right? This is a sewage system. 
Mazel Beige sewage. And we, when we used to first work out here, people remember this, we'd pull up there and they'd start agitating it. <laughs> it's really unpleasant. <laughs> okay, PP13B, which I think many of you have been to before. Um, uh, and PP56, which I, I reckon some folk are going to come down and have a look. I encourage you to do so. My team is down there now. It's an amazing sight to see the site open and excavating. We've got probably 25 people down there. It'll blow you away. So if you have the time, I, I encourage you to come down and, and see it. PP13B and PP56 are the two main sites. Um, so here we are up at the clubhouse, and the sites are down um, below. And there's a look at our section, which you'll see if you come down. So what have we found? Uh, our first major result was published in 2007 in Nature. Uh, Nature and Science are the world's two, more, two foremost scientific journals. They only publish work that's considered of extraordinary international significance. Many scientists go their entire lives without having papers in Nature and Science. Um, in our paper in 2007, we showed the earliest evidence for people using coastal resources. People were collecting olicroicles and brown mussel, and we even found whale barnacles. So these are the barnacles that live on the skin of whales. We don't think people were hunting them, um, but rather collecting strandings, dead animals. We also found very old ochre. This is the world's oldest modified ochre. And if you, the lighting's not so great, but you can see kind of these lines on it. Those lines come from taking the ochre and grinding it to create a powder. And they mix that with binders and paint their bodies. So it's, a, a, it's an indicator of symbolic activity. In 2009, we had a, a publication in the other major scientific journal, Science, Fire as an Engineering Tool of Early Modern Humans. And what we showed is, is that people were taking a stone called silkcrete, which is common in this area, but in its raw form, you can't flake it into a stone tool. It's too soft. But what they were doing is something ingenious. They were heating it and transforming it into a raw material that looks like that. And when you heat it, you change its flaking properties, and you can now make those beautiful stone tools. So that uh, spear point was made from this piece of silkcrete after it was heat treated. <laughs> now why is that important? You can't just throw it in the fry, right? You have to collect the silkcrete and you raise it to a temperature of 300 to 350 degrees centigrade and you hold it there and if that temperature fluctuates it fails. So in our experiments we were able to show that you actually have to build a kiln and you have to understand temperature properties and engineering properties. So it's a signal to us that people have long, complex chain recipe technologies, which require a lot of teaching, but also that they can make a novel association. People made a connection between heating properties and the engineering properties of stone. <coughs> that technology was dated back to 160,000 years ago, and the prior earliest dates had been 20,000. OK. So, why is shellfish collecting important? Um, many, I don't really need to explain this because in most audiences I talk to, they don't know the difference between a spring tide and a neap tide. But uh, what the shellfish collection shows us is that people have figured out the relationship between lunar schedules and tidal return rates. So of course during low neap tide, uh, the moon and sun, the gravitational forces are subtractive and the tide only moves a little bit. But during a spring tide, the gravitational forces are additive, and you can get way down in the intertidal zone. And when hunter-gatherers figure out the lunar calendar, they can start to use this part of the intertidal zone. And in South Africa, um, we have the earliest evidence for people figuring out that lunar relationship. So here's the timeline, 170,000 years ago, 120. 190,000. This is the upper balanoid zone. That's the easy one to get to. Here's the lower balanoid zone, kind of caution, right? Costly our zone, you need a spring tide to get down there. And what we see is by 90,000 years ago, people are all the way down in the costly our zone, 
which means they figured out that lunar system. Okay? Another proxy, it's a calendar proxy for symbolic behavior. We find them collecting seashells at 110,000 years ago, which we think that they're trading among each other. Now, this was the most recent um, major finding we made. It was published in late 2012 in Nature. And uh, what we showed is, is that at 71,000 years ago, at Pinnacle Point, people had invented a technology that we call microlithic technology. So microlithic technology uh, at Pinnacle Point we've dated to 71,000 years ago. That's a shorthand for thousands of years to 60,000. So it lasts for 11,000 years. And it suggests very advanced true projectile technology. And let me show you why. So how do you make a microlith? You take a little piece of stone and you set it up specially by special preparation. And you knock off these long, thin flakes. And you take those flakes and you snap them into little pieces like that. And then you take one side and you blunt it. And the sharp edge is the business edge. The blunted edge is where you push it into a slot <laughs> that you drill into a piece of wood or a piece of bone. And they're too small to hold in your hand, so they're normally about a centimeter or more. So we know that they were parts of a component technology. That's how they were used. So you take a piece of bone like this, you groove it, and you glue them in, and it makes a bolt or a dart for a bow and arrow or for an atlatl. An atlatl is a spear thrower. And that projectile technology is a huge advance because you can now throw your, your projectiles farther and more accurately and with more power than hand casting. And that was considered so important that nature featured it on the front cover of their magazine. And that beautiful artwork, you might recognize, that's Pinnacle Point right there, is produced by Eric uh, Fisher. And it's an indicator of what an atlatl um, can do. So when you develop an atlatl and you tie that to, for example, poison, you've created the most dangerous, most lethal predator the planet has ever seen. And it's right at around 70 to 60,000 years ago that people exit Africa. And we think that new projectile technology wedded to our pro-social abilities, the abilities to put together teams of people to work together and as warriors, probably allowed modern humans to exit out of Africa, rapidly drive the other species extinct, and basically take over the world. So let me wrap up um, what I've said. Uh, you know, here's our record of 200,000 um, years ago. We've shown, um, archaeologists have shown that around 75,000 years ago is when we first started seeing the origins of modern human behavior. Pinnacle Point has pushed that back all the way to 160,000. And that's why the international scientific community has become so interested in um, the research that, that we've been doing here. And uh, um, I think I'll stop there because I know Peter has some things he, he would like to say. Um, I'll leave out the climate change work. We can always, we can always come back to that. But I just want to recap um, the Pinnacle Point work uh, has been going on for about 10 years, and we see no end in sight. And we've had a lot of big discoveries. We've got, um, we've got several developing right now that you'll hear more about very shortly. Um, and they are easily of the level of nature and science publications. So the things that make this place special, in my opinion, is you have a unique record here, fabulous, fabulous record that's special from both for the local people, but also for the international community. The second thing is, is we have, we have a great scientific team, highly talented people who come here to work. And the third thing is, we have a very supportive homeowners association. In the last six, seven years, we've managed to form a cooperation, and a lot of that is under the leadership of Carl Fonda Linda, who has been a, a wonderful partner um, an interface uh, between the science team, led by me, and the Homeowners Association. And I, I want to thank them very much for their support. Okay.
Curtis, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Curtis? Yeah, just about the interbreeding. Yeah. Um, I suppose um, the, the shortest route for, for the two groups to interbreed would have been the Med crossing the Mediterranean. Yeah, so um, if, if you look at the gene, so, so if you look at the genome of East Asians and Western Europeans, and you look at the component that is Neanderthal, it's the same. So in other words, the Neanderthal genes that Japanese have are the same as the ones that Western Europeans have. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is that that founder population, as they came out of Africa, they would have come out near Israel, right? That's the land route out, Egypt and Israel. They, they encountered, the, the founder population encountered Neanderthals and interbred with them, and then split. So one group heads east and one group heads west to Europe. That's the only way you would get the Eastern Asians and the Western Europeans sharing the same gene of Neanderthals. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's how we know that it was that founder population. And in fact, the, the statistical modeling that has been done is very clear. And what it shows is, is that uh, the hybrids, so the hybrids of modern humans and Neanderthals had very low success rates. So in other words, most of them died. And, but some of those genes were very favorable. So they rose to high frequency and fixed in the population. And those could be things like um, resistance to cold weather, uh, light skin, um, it seems red hair has something to do with it. So in the next five years, we'll know specifically what those genes are. Yeah, all right. Is the, uh, the founded population, uh I heard just earlier, it was actually quite a small population. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, if you take, if you sample individuals from all modern human populations and look at the genetic diversity, it's tiny relative to other animals. So, for example, if we took two chimps from the same social group of chimps, they would have greater genetic diversity than a sample from Japanese, European, Australian, Aborigine, which is actually shocking, right? We, so we have this very narrow diversity. Um, the only way you get that diversity, well, you can get that diversity two ways. You have very small population for a very long time, or everybody, or the, you had one big population that had a cat catastrophic event that produced a single progenitor population that then spreads out and becomes everybody else. So yes, the bot, that's called the bottleneck. I said when we started that I, I, I think that, that the archaeology of Moscow Bay is going to be a complete game changer for tourism in this area. Um, the reason I say that is because there's a growing interest in, in, in evolution. In fact, the Smithsonian has registered the word evo-tourism, which is a damn shame because it's a very good word. And I, 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 can, I can imagine a day when we'll see the really luxurious tour of the evolution of, of humankind will begin in the old Y Gorge up in, uh, in East Africa, come down to the cradle of humankind, and then come down to have a look at what we've got here. And there are plans uh, to build a gateway museum in Mossel Bay. Um, we hope to see a museum eventually come at the, uh, at, at the, uh, at the point. Um, but for the meantime, we, 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 like all things, it has to start small. And next month, uh, Fred Auburn and the Oyster Catcher Trail, Peter Nielsen, the, Oyster, uh, the, the Homeowners Association, the SAC Before Project, will be coordinating uh, a tour for groups of up to 12 people at a time uh, to, the, to the Pinnacle Point Caves. Uh, and Peter will, uh, will, will uh, uh, accompany those tours, the Point of Human Origins tours. And uh, please go and have a look at the website. I'm very proud of it. We've just launched it www.humanorigin, without an S, humanorigin.coza. And now to tell us about that and, and other stuff, I hope, Peter Nielsen, uh, Dr. Peter Nielsen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.